Hey everyone. So I'm going to start this talk off with a question. And that's the question. What does the Minority Report, Black Mirror, and 1984 all have in common? Now, it's not the fact that they're all forms of media, you know, books, films, TV shows, nor is it the fact that they're about dystopian futures. But instead it's the fact that they each talk about predicting crime in one form or another. Whether that's the precogs in Minority Report, the recaller in Black Mirror, or the Fort Police in 1984. Each of these forms of media look at how we could predict crime, but more specifically, the repercussions of doing so. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. I'm going to be talking about how we can use natural language processing to predict crime. But for those of you that know me, will know I'm not a mathematician, and I'm also not a police officer. So why am I talking about natural language processing, which is quite mathy, and predictive policing, which, as the name may suggest, is all to do with law and crime. Well, it comes down to this quote. The idea that intrusion analysis, security analysis, it's about far more than the tools we use. It's about innovating, at looking at new ways that we can protect ourselves from attacks, but also predict those attacks in the first place. So what am I actually going to be talking about today? Well, I want to break it up into three main areas. I want to talk about what predictive policing actually is. I want to talk about what natural language processing is. And then finally, I want to talk about how we can merge these two ideas together. How we can predict crime using natural language processing. Before I begin, though, who am I? Well, my name is James Stevenson, and this time, two years ago now, I was a student at the University of South Wales, studying computer security. Before that, I was an intern at Alert Logic, a cloud security company, and these days I'm a software engineer at BT Security. But jumping straight into it, what is predictive policing? I keep talking about it, but what actually is it? Because if we're going to use natural language processing to predict crime, then we kind of need to know what predictive policing is. And it comes down to two main areas, location-based predictive policing and individual-based predictive policing. Now, location-based predictive policing, as the name suggests, is all about looking at an area. So it's saying, in this area, in the future, is a crime likely to occur. Now, this map is a great example of location-based predictive policing. So this is a map of London between a specific time period, where the darker the color, it shows that the more crime has occurred. Now, this is a great example. Because we can say, okay, if a crime has occurred under these specific circumstances in the past, then it means that a crime is likely to occur under these same circumstances in the future. Now today we're actually going to be focusing on individual-based predictive policing. Now individual-based predictive policing is all about looking at an individual and saying, how likely is this individual to commit a crime? And when it comes to this type of predictive policing, we can ask different questions, we'll go down different routes, different avenues, and we'll be left with that score. Now today, we're going to focus on three types or three approaches that can allow us to do just this. The first of these approaches we're going to look at is called strain theory. Now strain theory is the idea that society puts pressure on individuals to achieve specific goals, like the American dream. But when individuals lack the means, to achieve those goals, they're more likely to commit crimes so that they can achieve them. The next theory that we're going to look at is called social control theory. Now, social control theory is the idea that people who lack close relationships, commitments, values, or norms, are more likely to commit crimes because they don't have those relationships or values as an anchor in society. And then the final theory that we're going to look at today is called social disorganization theory. Now, what this theory states is it says that location is key. If you live or work in an area known for a specific type of crime, this theory states that intrinsically, by being there, you're more likely to commit crime. So, so far, we've looked at what predictive policing is, different types of predictive policing, and how we can use predictive policing approaches to predict crime. But this talk is all about natural language processing. It's all about how we can use natural language processing to do just that. But before we talk about natural language processing, we need to talk about language first. So for us, as human beings, language comes down to these three main areas. Speaking, reading, and writing. Things that we all do every day. 
So because we do these things every day, most of us, or maybe some of us, will be able to answer this question. Paris minus France plus England equals what? Now, the answer is London. Because Paris is to France as London is to England. Now, if we didn't know that that was the answer, why did we know that that was the answer? Well, we would have known that that was the answer because of the experiences we've had. We've read books, gone on the internet, spoken to people, and that's all built our knowledge base and our understanding. So then, if we were to give that question to our natural language processing machine, would it be able to answer it? Well, yes, but only if we gave it the right context. So this is the Wikipedia article for London. And if we fed this into our natural language processing machine, it would learn from that surrounding context. It would learn that London is a city. It would learn that London is in the UK, of which England is as well, building that knowledge base and building that understanding. So if that's how natural language processing works, how does sentiment analysis work? Because sentiment analysis is all about that tool looking at a specific piece of text and saying, what is the emotion? What is the sentiment? behind that text. And when it comes to us, as human beings, we have eight main pillars to our emotions. But for sentiment analysis, we only really care about two. That's positive emotions and negative emotions. So how do we translate those eight pillars down to two? Well, when we're talking about positive emotions, we're really talking about trust, joy, anger, and surprise. Anger being the red herring. And when we're talking about negative emotions, we're talking about disgust, sadness, fear, and anticipation. And so, if those are the emotions that we're talking about when we refer to sentiment analysis, how do we actually get that emotion from text? Well, it's the same as most machine learning approaches. We take a massive data set. Now, that data set for us is going to be restaurant reviews. Each element in that set is broken down into two subsections. The actual review, and then the sentiment of that review. For example, I love my local pizza restaurant, positive sentiment. Well, this place has really gone downhill, negative sentiment. We then break this data set down into two. We have our training set and we have our testing set. When it comes to training our natural language processing machine, we ask it to go through those entities and to have a look at what keywords are more prominent with a positive sentiment and what keywords are more prominent with a negative sentiment. Then when it comes to testing, we ask it to go through the remaining entities and for, for it to tell us what the sentiment is. And then if that matches the sentiment we know them to have, great. But if it doesn't, then it means something has gone wrong. So if that's how natural language processing works, if that's how sentiment analysis works, what already exists? What are some examples of natural language processing in the real world? Well, this is AWS Comprehend, or specifically Comprehend Medical which is AWS's approach to natural language processing when it comes to medicine and healthcare. A doctor or healthcare professional will type in a patient's details, symptoms, information. The natural language processing tool will go off, do its thing, and it will come back with key bits of information it thinks that that healthcare professional needs to know. Next, we have Tay.ai. Now, Tay.ai was Microsoft's approach to natural language processing when it came to a Twitter chatbot. Tay would tailor its response to people, depending on how people spoke to it. Now, it's quite controversial. It lasted just under 24 hours, but nonetheless, is a great example. And then finally, we have predictive text. So whether or not you own an Android or an iPhone, the way that predictive text most probably works on your device is by using natural language processing. So there we have three great examples. We've got healthcare, communications, and mobile phones. But none of those examples look at how we can use natural language processing to predict crime, which is why we're here for this talk. So let's do that. Well, this is Alice, and it's Alice's job to do just that. It's Alice's job to predict crime. The way she currently does this, she individually and manually goes to different websites, chat forums, social media accounts, and she profiles individuals on their likelihood of committing crime. But that's slow and laborious. So how can we take this to the next level? Well, we can automate it. We can scrape these websites for the same information that we would have. 
We can use natural language processing on the response. And then we can return to Alice a score, a score of how likely that individual is to commit a crime. And this is what we're going to be focusing on for the rest of today. We're going to be talking about how we could build a conceptual framework that allows us to do just this. So if we were to create this framework, what would we need to do? Well, first of all, Alice would need to sit down and decide on the impact. Who are we profiling and what is the impact of those individuals? If that individual was to commit that crime or was to perform that attack, what would the impact be? And this comes down to those three main areas, the loss of confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Once we have that impact, we want to work out our likelihood. What is the likelihood of that individual committing that crime or performing that attack? Well, this is where we're going to go back to those predictive policing approaches that we mentioned earlier on. First of all, we scrape these websites for that text. We use natural language processing on the response. And now we say, does that text contain reference to any goals or aspirations? And then if it does, what is the sentiment? Next, we take that same bit of text and we say, now does that text contain reference to any close relationships, any individuals, any groups, any organizations? And if so, what is the sentiment? And then finally, we take that same bit of text once again, and we say, now does that text contain reference to the individual's location? If so, is it a location known for that type of crime? And then finally, what is the sentiment? We then go through each of these trees, aggregating a score as we go. And that score is our overall likelihood. We can then use that with our impact to get our risk. And that risk is the risk that this individual poses to Alice and her team. Now that we have that risk, it's just about collecting as much information as we can using natural language processing. When we collect information like common topics, trends, age, gender, and race, occupation, salary, and religion, and then any dates and times. Now, the reason why we haven't focused on this information today is because this information has the scope and the potential of becoming significantly more biased. And that's really a talk for another day. So, finally, as part of this conceptual framework, it's about creating a naming convention. A naming convention that we can instantly glean information from without including any of that personally identifiable information. So this name is broken down into four main areas. The source of the data, the time it occurs, the risk score, and then a pseudo-random word that gives the name some uniqueness. So we've looked at what predictive policing is. We've looked at what natural language processing is. And we've also looked at how we can use these two ideas together to predict crime. But you might be thinking, well, James, that's great. But why are we talking about predictive policing at a computer security conference? And well, it comes back to this quote. The idea that intrusion analysis, security analysis, it's about far more than the tools we use. It's about innovating, but it's also about thinking outside of the box and looking at new ways that we can protect ourselves from attacks, but also predict those attacks in the first place. So what I'm going to do next, I'm going to go through some questions that I normally get as part of this talk. I'll close the talk off, and then if we have any additional questions, I'll go through them now. So the first question we have here is, is predictive policing better than normal policing? Now, I think the answer here is no. Predictive policing is a tool. It's a supplement. It's something that should be used in addition to normal policing and isn't there to replace police, nor is it there to replace police intuition. The next question we have is, is predictive policing bias? Again, the short answer is yes. Predictive policing is quite biased. The reason for that is predictive policing is garbage in, garbage out. If our data is biased, it means that our frameworks are going to be biased also. And the problem with crime data is that it's intrinsically biased. Because we have crimes that aren't documented, maybe like assault, it means that the data we get from that isn't accurate, isn't representative of the real world. And that's fine as long as we remember the answer to that first question. As long as we remember that predictive policing is a tool, it's a secret, <coughs> and it's to be used in addition to what we're already doing. <laughs> Next question there is, is predictive policing used in the real world? So predictive policing is used in the UK. It's also used in the US. 
One example that received quite a lot of media attention was the LAPD in the States. They had a scheme called LASER. The way that LASER worked is it assigned a score to ex-offenders. That score was based on their behavior. And the way that that worked is anyone in that top bracket would then receive a follow-up visit from police. The penultimate question we have here is how good is natural language processing at picking up differences or nuances in text? And there's an example I like giving for this, and it's an example of a natural language processing tool that was created to simultaneously understand two different languages. And I think that's really interesting, because that goes to show that actually, in some cases, natural language processing can be better at understanding text than some of us as human beings. And then finally, what's next? Well, specifically for this framework, it's about creating a proof of concept. A proof of concept that allows us to do just this, allows us to look at risk levels for individuals, that allows us to pivot off social media information, and allows, it to, allows, pardon me, and allows us to look at crime signals, so indicators for crime. However, that is this talk coming to a close. If you do have any questions, feel free to ask me now. Come find me afterwards, or I'm also on Twitter at underscore James Stevenson. Thanks, everyone.